All right. So first, in full disclosure, we have what are called institutes, and all of our PD specialists are over an institute. I'm over distance learning and tech integration, not career pathways. That would be Dr. Escamilla. Um, but since she didn't come, I will be talking about this. And what we did, uh, she helped me round up some information about what's been going on. Now, Texas is a little unique um, in that we have, similar to California, a large proportion of people who are born in Latin America and are non-citizens. So a great deal of our efforts are with ESL. So there's always been a push for the IELC um, from the very beginning. But the other part of this is that Texas is under our workforce. It's under Texas Workforce Commission. That happened in 2013. It's transferred from the Texas Education Agency. Big chaos, as you can imagine. And because we went under workforce, even actually even right before then, Texas Education Agency, Adult Education, Texas Learns, was doing a lot of contextualization, text best, I best type models. And then when Texas Workforce took over, then it was a huge push for integrated education and training, obviously, because they're workforce. That's what they're interested in, is getting our people to work. And we have 36 grantees this year, I think. And that's from the WIOA funds for uh, adult education, AFA. But they're kind of unique, because Texas is a local control state. If you've looked at the map, it's a pretty big state. And they are very independent in every area. I think it's like five little countries inside of one state. So we have community colleges. There's 18 of them. We have independent school districts. Uh, there's five of those. There's educational service centers, which are the professional development centers for the public school system. We have a couple of nonprofits. I actually work for one of those at night. And then we have workforce boards. So the grantees are pretty scattered in what they do um, and how they administer their programs is accordingly different but it is a part of their grant requirements to do integrated education and training and that with IELTC, Civics, E, I, E, L, C, E. So we um, don't have as many students. When I heard, what did you say for California? 500,000 students? We have that many people, but we can't get them to our classes. So um, we, we serve usually around 80,000 uh, a year, 80 to 90,000 depending on the year. And so this is, um, by the way, if you don't like these slides, uh, I stole these from our state director, so you can complain to him. <laughs> so <laughs> these are some, you know, our definitions are pretty much straight from, um, from AFLA. So the WIOA 231 is our EL Civics funds. WIOA 243 is our integrated EL Civics funds. Um, our regular EL Civics should include workforce training, workforce preparation activities, and our integrated uh, EL Civics must include a plan to get them back to work. Okay, so what's changed? We um, have really expanded who we're trying to market to. Um, in the past, we didn't take people who had a high school diploma. Now, if they have a high school diploma but they do not have basic skills, they are in our programs. So we're, we're getting a lot of military, um, and we're getting a lot of um, people that we didn't used to work with. And also, because we're working with the workforce boards, um, we're, with this integrated education and training, a lot of times we're providing the education and they're paying for the training because they have funds under WIOA also. So we also have a huge focus, as I was saying, on the internationally trained English language learning professionals. We do not use the word immigrant in Texas because people have a reaction to it. So when we're talking about this population, we just say professionally, internationally trained professionals. And we have been working very diligently about getting those programs up and running. Let's see, they are, when they do their IET plans, they have to go to the workforce board, look at the data, and use the in-demand occupations. They can't just do whatever. They have to justify that that occupation is something in-demand in their workforce area. And then they have to work with their workforce development boards, which has been very interesting. But I will say it's starting to come together. There was big chaos, who's on first, in the very beginning, but I have seen most of the workforce boards are now working very well with the grantees. And then Anson had this brilliant idea that we would have 20,000 people finish an IET by 2020. Thank you, Anson. We appreciate that. He says it was not him, it was the, um, the advisory board. 
I don't know. I was there. It sounded like him to me. But <laughs> don't tell him I said that. So, so that was a very large goal, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. I will say one thing that he is very good about is getting money from our legislators. So where we needed money to pull this off, he's gone back and he has um, gotten us, instead of having, for example, 629 per, um, getting us up to 1800 so that we have 2429 for a student in IET rather than just 629. That makes a huge difference when you're trying to serve people. So we um, have increased that a little bit every year and it's definitely paying off. One of the things that we are kind of surprised about, and I know we shouldn't be, the first couple of years, the people that were in the integration education and training programs were not making very good skills gains. They were getting jobs, which counts as an MSG, but they weren't actually doing better in their basic literacy skills. And so we kind of focused on it the next two years, and now what we see is the, the people that are in those integrated education and training programs do actually better than our students who are not which is good, that's what we would like to see, <laughs> but it doesn't always happen. So that's the new one. Our standard enrollment is uh, about 14% less than our IET, e, IELC students. So here's my part. So um, with, with Dr. Escamilla's help, I went and said, okay, who's doing what? I need very quickly to say who's doing what. So here you go, Laredo Community College. On that far right, those are the career pathways they have. Dental assisting, professional truck driving, bookkeeping, um, small business uh, management certification, accounting clerk, EKG technician, EMS leading to an EMT certification. In Texas, it has to be a nationally or state recognized credential. It cannot just be OSHA 10. That does not count as a credential. It has to be something they can get a job with. So if you'll notice, a lot of these will be um, those kinds of credentials. They're working with Allied Health Department and Continuing Education Department of the college. Um, of course, challenges, keeping them in your class until they get the credential. That's always a challenge for everybody. Um, also, aligning the courses, and I love this, it was, we don't, we don't know what we don't know. That was what he basically said. He said, we don't know what we don't know, so we don't know how to create the course properly in the beginning because we didn't know what the school was expecting. We didn't know what the students were going to know. Um, so, but they have done very well. They've got all of their CDL Class A participants actually got their CDLs. That's good. Um, and 11 passed the bookkeeping certification and 9 passed dental assisting. So they're working very good. I've got five minutes, so I'm going to go really fast. They're looking to do um, CompTIA and CNA program next year. This is Region 5, Beaumont, which is over towards Louisiana. We haven't given them to Louisiana yet. Um, and you can see that they have several other um, different ones, QuickBooks, Edmund, MS Office. A lot of them are doing MS Office right now. But they're also doing welding, welding and pharmacy tech. And they're hoping to do phlebotomist, diabetes, paraprofessional, medical billing, and cosmetology and hospitality. I think Anson would go through the roof with the cosmetology, but I'll let that go. And then this is my, my organization, Entrepreneur, CNA, and Bookkeeping. And we have a fully online ESL professionals because community action is the rural area around the capital. So we don't have a lot of students. We just have a lot of geographic area to cover. So all of our um, ESL for professionals is done online, the whole, the whole course. They have really some interesting t things, too. They've worked with an uh, immigration lawyer um, to help the entrepreneurs actually get their businesses started. It's been pretty interesting. Far West, now this is El Paso area, and they are amazing. Um, they have worked with the local ISD's career and technical education departments, and they have just rocked my world as far as getting people into jobs. Their biggest challenge in the beginning was they had all of these great ideas, and they put out these flyers in Spanish, and they got people in who didn't have sufficient English for the careers, so then they stopped doing the flyers in Spanish. And then the other problem was they got people who came in for the career in technical education who weren't actually interested in the job, they just wanted the education. And so they had to start screening better for people to make sure that they were people that they wanted in the class. Um, Victoria has one of the best relationships with the workforce boards as far as I can tell. Um, and they are always um, moving in a better direction. They're small school, they're very small. Um, they got hit hard by Harvey, and they rebounded from that pretty well. But they just continue to work with their workforce board and get things going. They have a goal for getting an LVN. I'm not sure how they're going to do an LVN through adult education, 
but that's their goal, so I'm going to see what they do. And then Southwest Texas Junior College, one of the first schools that was doing a lot of these IETs, IELCEs. Um, and all of these, by the way, include English language learners. So they're IETs and IELCE, and they, not, they are not necessarily separated. Um, again, retention is the biggest problem. But six of the six that took the CMA passed, so that's good. That's the certified uh, medical assistant. And here we go, finally. So here's our 2020. We got there two years early and 3,000 over. So it took a lot. It is a very much a team effort across the state, um, but our leadership has done a great job getting us money and training, which is a big deal. And um, we have career navigators. We have all kinds of resources. So we're very excited about the way that we're going, and we're going to continue to grow those models as we continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenda. Corey? All right. Good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Ryala. Laura, you said my last name perfectly. Yay. That's It's very rare. Ryala. It's a little tough to say. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk about um, Integrated Yale Civics with you guys. I'm also excited because I'm going to Disneyland after this. <laughs> I'm going to um, the, star, the new Star Wars thing, so I apologize if I um, jet out as soon as I'm done. Um, there I am. Um, okay, so I'm just going to uh, sort of lay out from a state perspective what we've been doing with uh, IELCE in California. This, <laughs> speaking of stealing, I stole this from Anson also. Um, <laughs> I changed the, the numbers to make it United States and California to show the, you know, Car Carolyn often s will say that the, um, that one out of every four immigrants in the United States lives in California, which is pretty remarkable. And you can see the numbers there, almost, almost a fourth there. And then, and then not surprisingly, with those numbers, you can see the number of, of the percentage of uh, foreign born in, in California versus in the United States. And then those other uh, uh, percentages, um, not surprising, but all to say there is a great need for this program in California. So what are we doing to address it? In California, we have 199 providers uh, with Afflin. Four of those are consortia, so there are actually even more agencies. You can see the number of instructors and the number of students there, 197,000 ELLs. Uh, we've, you heard a little bit about our EL Civics program that's been going strong for almost 20 years. We have lots of, we have lots of students in that. And then um, of the 199 providers, we have 119 that chose to apply and were accepted for the uh, integrated EL Civics, the 243 funds. I'm going to focus on those last two um, numbers there for a moment, just drill down a little bit. So the, the 97,000 is, is the number of um, students in our integrated EL Civics program, our ILCE program. And then the, the 4,700 are the number of students who are also co-enrolled in training, okay? Got a graphic that just goes into that a little bit more. So this one is, the, is that 4,700 number. If you look at the, the blue, purplish uh, slice of the pie there, that's how many, uh, uh, that, that's the 4,700 students. You can see that that's about a third of the students in the country that, um, that are enroll, co-enrolled in training and, and doing IELCE. That's probably not surprising considering the size of, of California, right? This one's a little more surprising. This is the 97,000. So these are the students who are in the 243 program. And you can sort of see the percentage there of, of California students versus the rest of the country. And this speaks to a slightly different way that we ran this program. Uh, we, we definitely took to heart the idea that not every student in the integrated EL Civics program needs to be co-enrolled in training. That not, not every student is ready or, or even interested in that training, but they could benefit from the program itself. So how did we set that up? When, when uh, in the first year of the grant, we gave everyone who uh, applied and was, was accepted for this part of the grant $30,000 in program development funds to kind of build, build their program up. We released a toolkit 
um, which you can find on the CASAS website, by the way. All of this information is on the CASAS website. Um, the toolkit we developed had a, a policy framework in there that laid out all the regulations. It had a program development tool that agencies could work through, kind of a human-centered design approach if they, if, it was, if they were brand new to integrated EL Civics. And then also a plan template. So for this template, we were asking them, we're in, you know, if we're saying we're giving you $30,000 in, in program development funds, we want to know that you're actually doing some planning. And so we, re we required of them a deliverable, which we called an integrated EL Civics program development plan. This was due um, in April of 2018. You can see the things there that it listed. It, there, was, there, was a lot, there was a lot to it. There was a lot of narrative, and it, it took a lot of writing. Um, we heard some grumbling from, from agencies. There was a little too much writing, and that's understandable. But overall, I think it was a good process for them, and then it was a very good process for us to be able to really hear what they were thinking, what, what, what the agencies were thinking about in terms of developing this program. When the, when the plans came in, we, uh, we, we reviewed them. And the process we used to review them is that we had one consultant, like myself, from the state. And then um, mostly there were CASA specialists who were, who were reading them with us. So, so we sort of paired up and we read these and decided whether or not we could approve their plan or we needed them to work on them a little bit more. Here's sort of the initial breakdown. Uh, about 58% approved, so they, they sort of knew what they were doing. 42% needed some revision, and those are the folks that we worked with quite a bit. Just a, a little more breakdown to this, we, we looked at all the, each of the components of IET. So not surprising, adult education literacy, 76% of our agencies did a great job with that. Uh, they were in the advanced category. Um, developing sort of meant, well, you're not doing it quite right this year, but you have a plan to do it next year. And so we say, okay, you're, you're on track. We can approve your plan in a developing status. And then inadequate was the 7%. Those are folks who weren't doing it this year and did not have a good plan for doing it next year. And so we really needed to provide some technical assistance to them. And that's what we did. Um, for the workforce preparation, similar. You know, 67 were, were, were uh, off, the ra off to the races. 26% um, were developing, and again, 7% were inadequate. Where, where it got trickier, and this is not surprising, is the workforce training. Here, only 35% were uh, what we considered advanced. They were really implementing workforce training. This, uh, this was 17, 18. 39% had a good plan for doing it the following year, and then a whopping 26% really either didn't, didn't have a plan or weren't articulating their plan very well, and so we really needed to go back and work with them. We also looked at um, how well those three components were happening at the same time, you know, the degree to which they were, they were happening simultaneously. Similar breakdown to the last one, about thirds. And then also how well contextualized those were, so that are the, are the people from the different programs working together to make that happen? And again, about, about the same, thirds. So anyway, that's all to say that it took a lot of work, and the, the CASA specialists and, the, and, and my colleagues at the, at the department worked really hard with, with agencies to get them uh, kind of on the right track with this, and we've seen a lot of progress since then. So moving into the next year, uh, this, this, this year, we also asked for another deliverable. This one we didn't call. You'll see it's not called the program development plan. So we sort of dropped the program development plan. There were, we didn't give out the $30,000 again. And then, and because of that, partially because of that, we simplified this quite a bit. Um, they still needed to report on what they were doing. Um, in terms of the requirements, we put in an assurance section. Um, we, we talked about the co-apps. Um, we also, like Texas, we also have a, a, a list of industry-recognized post-secondary credentials that, that these programs need to be leading toward. And then we also have a table describing each of the, comp the components. Part two, um, so part one is sort of what, what, what happened in the, pre in the current year, and then part two is the planning for, for 1920. 
Um, the other big change with this, I have to say, is that we um, we uh, handed handed more of the work off to Casas. The the first first go around, my office did a lot of the work, and so we had a, a fillable PDF. You know, we did we did our best. Um, with Casas taking over, you know, they've got the programmers who, who have have all the expertise, and so they created a beautiful uh, online application where this is just one example where agencies could put in each of uh, for all of their courses with the times and the days so we can really see if, if those, those classes are happening in some concurrent fashion. So big kudos to CASAS for, for stepping up here. Um, and then um, before I get to that one, just it, we're sort of in, in the tail end of, of, of finishing those reviews, CASAS is, and um, so I don't have the data on that yet, but, but I'm excited to hear how, how the agencies did in terms of um, approving, uh, approved, and who needs some work still, but it's exciting. And then next, um, we are uh, in the process of getting ready for our next competitive uh, three-year grant cycle. And so in doing that, we're thinking about how to, how to change this plan moving forward. And one of the ideas is to combine this deliverable with a couple of other deliverables we have in the state into more of a, uh, an annual update. So instead of a kind of perfunctory reapplication that we've had agencies do in the past, this would be um, an opportunity for them to show us what their plan is for year two and year three of the grant cycle. Again, a little bit of a work in progress, but, um, but I, think it's v I think it's really promising and, and um, CASAS has been helping us with that as well. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Corey. Now we have Sigrin Utash will give you more specific information about her agency. Hi, so I'm Sigrin Utash. I teach um, ESL intermediate level in Simi Valley. I also teach citizenship. I teach a grammar class and I teach uh, an IET class in basic machine shop. And we've been doing that for about, this is our, we're finishing up our second year. So um, it was very interesting to hear Corey um, talk about all the details because um, it, it helps me reflect why we made the decisions that we did. And um, I think we're doing a good job. So uh, I just want to show you what we have. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, machine shop one. We'll talk about uh, how we set it up, how it looks, um, what we do each week. I'll talk about the collaboration between myself and um, my CTE instructor, but also administration, and um, challenges and successes that we've encountered. So um, the CTE part of our um, technical program it has three main components that we have um, um, the teacher does lectures once a week. We have the students have to work on projects, and they get um, they have assessments as they complete the program. So he has three levels of um, in the machine shop program, and I'm involved with the basic machine shop. So these are these things are going on. Um, continuously, so it's in a cycle. But his lectures are, are mostly theoretical, and this is what I can help the students with because there's some reading involved, a lot of vocabulary, and I help them with the language skills that they need to succeed in, their, um, in the CTE program. So I'll show a little bit later how, what a typical week or semester looks like. All right, so his assessments are CTE-driven. Um, so his lectures are uh, once a week on Tuesdays, and it, like I said, it's theoretical, so he might talk about how to interpret a blueprint one week. He might um, talk about different uh, features or different um, ways to measure how to make a, a thread, things like this. So his lecture is about a half an hour long, and I'm in the classroom also, but I'm not teaching. I'm there to offer um, the language support that the ESL students might need. 
So um, I get there a half an hour before the lecture and I kind of review with the students because the week before is when I um, preview the lesson with the ESL students. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, IET with me, they get a preview on, on the Thursday before the lecture. Tuesday's the, the real lecture and then on the, fall, the Thursday afterward, we review again. So Thursdays, uh, students attend IET class, preview vocabulary and concepts. And then on Tuesday, they go for the CTE lecture and um, he provided me all of his PowerPoints. So you would think the students get bored hearing the same thing over and over, but they really appreciate um, a slower pace and having the chance to ask questions. Because when they're in the CTE lecture, there are a lot of English speaking students there and they might, the ESL students are a little hesitant. You know, nobody wants to look foolish in front of um, anyone else. So. Um, so anyway, they like hearing it a second time. And then uh, the Thursday after that Tuesday lecture, we review what they learned on Tuesday and then they get a preview for the following week. And I give them a vocabulary quiz and um, there are some other things that we do um, on Thursday nights. So this is my, uh, that's a typical week. Um, no lab on Sunday. Mondays they can go to the lab, work on their projects, uh, talk to the teacher. Tuesday's the CTE lecture with IET support. They can work on their projects after the lecture and then Wednesday they're working on their projects. The, um, the CTE instructor recommends that they come in, they come in, do the open lab for at least 25 hours a week. So that's a lot of time to spend in the lab. Um, so they, they have a three month period of time between when they pay their fees and when they, when they should be finished. But he's very flexible, you know, if it takes them longer, they just sign up for another three month session. So um, yeah, there's a lot of CTE learning going on, but there's a lot of, we offer a lot of uh, ESL support. So Wednesdays they can go, Thursdays they can be in the lab until it's time for IET class. Um, we have our class in a different classroom. And then uh, Saturday they can come in for five hours and work on their projects. So in addition to the lectures, students in the basic machine shop class are required to complete eight projects. So a T-slot cleaner, that has to be made by hand, filed, but there's a lot of measuring uh, that they learn. They make a bolt gauge, they make a V-block. Isn't that amazing <laughs> for beginning level students? Um, an indicator holder. They don't make the dial, but they make the, uh, the thing that it goes in. A tapping center. There's a spring inside and a vice stop. Um, the hammer. That's, that's like their piece de resistance. <laughs> that's really hard to make. And uh, the screwdriver. So. Um, so here's an example of what the students receive from the CTE instructor. I, I've hyperlinked all of these um, Things. So if you choose to download this from the CASAS website, you can, you can see the details. But um, this is what it looks like. <laughs> so it's really, I mean, if I were a student, I would be pretty intimidated by that. So this is a blueprint that goes with the instructions. That's the V block. And then this is what I've created for the ESL students to help them understand what it is they need to do. So this, these are the different parts that they have to manufacture. I've taken those instructions and I've kind of color coded them and separated them into sections so um, it's a little easier for them to see what the, what's involved. I've also found uh, videos on YouTube. I've run it by the uh, CTE instructors so they're, um, you know, there's a lot of resource, and they can watch those videos again and again if they if they need to. I've shown them how to slow down the uh, video on um, on YouTube. You know, you can set it um, to three quarters speed, so that helps them a lot too. So, at the end of the um, semester, they're required to give an oral presentation. So they have eight projects to work on, but they only have to present one to me. Um, 
So it's a multi-step process. While they're working on their projects, they're supposed to be taking pictures of themselves and writing a description, not just copying from the instructions that the, uh, the CTE inst instructor has given them because they're not really demonstrating the language learning that's happened. So they're learning technical skills. This is from my, my guidelines for the students. Um, so for the career tech class, you will learn technical skills in the machine shop. Um, I'll skip down a little bit. In order to practice your English skills, you'll describe how you completed one project. You will practice your English writing skills by describing at least five steps, and then I'll skip down to the speaking. You know, it helps. Um, when I give them an assignment like this, sometimes I think, oh, teacher, one more thing I've got to do. But if, I, if I'm specific and, and tell them exactly what the purpose is, they start to see that it's... It, it really will help them, especially when they go for a job interview, that they can explain what it is they know how to do. So this is um, like the second half of that planning process. So um, that's one of this is one of the things I do on Tuesday evenings when I'm uh, there for the lecture. After the lecture, they can work on their projects. So I'm walking around taking pictures of them, or if they're running a machine, I might uh, take a video, and we um, load those into the the PowerPoints that they present. So um, if you want to see an example of, of the oral presentation, this is um, one of the students I had this semester. Um, this semester I actually took, um, he, I, had him, I, I had him do all of the uh, planning. I had him, then we ran it by the CTE teacher, make sure that you know, he's actually, that's actually what he was supposed to be doing. Then we came back to the class. I recorded him, him speaking these words, and he made a lot of mistakes. So I made him, you know, repeat it over and over until his pronunciation was perfect. So, and um, if uh, he was uh, Francisco's from the Philippines, so he had certain certain sounds that were difficult for him to uh, make. So I found some videos, and we we went over and over. So um, it was really great. That was a really great uh, PowerPoint. Of, uh, this is like the final uh, check to see if the part is the right uh, right measurements. They have to they they were supposed to manufacture it to a certain size, and then it's supposed to fit in a channel. To it's it's used to clean out the debris from the channels on the milling machine. So um, Alex did a great job, and it fit perfectly, of course. <laughs> and he explained about uh, what he was doing. I mean, the way we assess if students are, are making language um, skills improvement is by, um, by uh, teaching the co-ops and assessing them. So the first year we did one on uh, job safety. Uh, but as you know, if you, if, if you teach um, EL civics, there, you have to teach that topic for 30 hours before you assess them. So for me, if I taught 30 hours on just job safety, the students wouldn't come to my class anymore. <laughs> so last, uh, last year, uh, I wrote a co-op uh, related to machine technology, and um, uh, Lori helped me with the, uh, you know, the points break down and, and what what I needed to do. So that was really, really helpful because it's the two tasks are, uh, one is um, interpreting a blueprint, which is such a major part of the, the basic machine shop class. And the second part is the oral presentation. So those are, you know, uh, uh, the first year we did the job safety objective and we did preparing for a job interview because that, that is also one of the, um, skills that the CTE instructor requires of the students. He makes them go to the Jobs and Career Center on campus and work on a resume, do a mock interview. So, you know, you can see it all kind of ties together. So all these pieces of the puzzle have to come together. And um, so the machine tech language skills are what, um, what we did this year for the first time. And it, it turned out pretty well, I think. I talked a little bit about how I collaborated with the CTE instructor. He has been so helpful. He gave me all of his PowerPoints. He's always available to talk. Um, um, so I can't say enough about my colleague. Um, so collaborate on the line. So in order to generate interest in this program, we, we take all of the ESL students to our 
machine shop. This year, we since we're having three IETs next year, we kind of had our career or uh, CTE uh, field trip day. So we went to machine shop, and then we stopped off in business and computers. The week before, we went to um, manicuring. Manicuring will be our next one uh, next year. So the teacher, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to tell your students, go to machine shop. You'll really like it. It's a good career. But to take them over to, there, to introduce them to the teacher, he's very welcoming. He talks about his own um, language. Uh, challenges. He's from Norway, so he understands what it's like to learn a new language. So um, he's um, he gives them an overview of what they're going to learn and so on. Uh, we have uh, flyers promoting our program throughout the school. We have one for machine shop, one for business and computers. Next year we'll have one for um, manicuring. Uh, the way I came up with my curriculum, I didn't design it on my own. I based it on what he already had. So it's my IET course outline is based on his um, basic machine shop course outline. Then I came up with a syllabus. So it has a, you'll see it's, it's hyperlinked, but here's a calendar. So for example, the first night of class, August 21st, they would learn unit one, August 23rd, on Thursday, they meet privately with me, and uh, they get an introduction to the course. We review what they learned on Tuesday. We preview coordinate systems. The following Tuesday, they learn about coordinate systems. The fall uh, after that, the Thursday after that, we review the blueprint unit two and four, or pre uh, preview, and then, so it's kind of like a spiral, right? And it goes on and on <laughs> all semester. So challenges. The time required to complete course requirements, it, it's very intensive. If they're taking ESL classes, the, the course certificates um, take about three to 400 hours of, of working on projects and taking tests. So um, if they have full-time jobs, they, have they might have difficulty making time in their busy schedules. Um, the, I don't, I don't think I showed you, the, he, the lab is open from 8 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. So students can make their own schedules. They know what the requirements are. It's up to them to, um, to fit it in. And like I said, if they, don't, if they don't fit it in within three months, they just sign up for another one. Okay, um, scheduling conflicts. So some students go to ESL classes in addition to IET. So although we have been flexible with the time requirements, some students still see this as a barrier to participating. There's our first graduate, <laughs> Hugh. Um, and that's Agar, the, um, the CTE instructor. And we're standing in front of the lathe. So that was last summer. And since then, we've had a couple more people um, complete our program. Um, when they complete the basic machine shop, they're not done, right? They can earn uh, several certificates, but uh, my responsibility is with the basic uh, class. But for the coming year, I want to help them with the next class, which is uh, the CNC. So it's a lot of work. I'm not going to lie, but it's um, it's really gratifying, especially if they get a job, if they get a high-paying job. Um, they can earn as much as. You know, fifteen dollars an hour, fresh out of school, twenty out, twenty dollars after, after a year, and with a couple years of experience, they can earn thirty to thirty-five dollars an hour, and there are a lot of jobs in our community, so it kind of all ties together with the requirements for the, um, for the IET. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seagrin. Thank you, everyone, all of our panelists, and for all of you for your attention.